All right. Thanks so much for uh, joining us, everyone, tonight. Um, we are having our panel on equity, diversity, and inclusion, hosted by the Student Professionalism and Ethics Association. My name is Caitlin Liu, and I am the Canadian Regent of SPIA. We are joined today by a panel of five experienced dentists who will be sharing their experiences working with diverse communities across Canada. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, say a few acknowledgements and thank yous. So uh, thank you to the Canadian chapters who collaborated today uh, to put this event together. Um, it was truly a cross Canada, cross, uh, cross nation effort, um, and they will be helping us to introduce our speakers as we go along. Um, thank you to the ACD and Dr. Rucker for arranging uh, financial support for us. So we will be having a draw, thanks to them. And thank you to them for also attending today's event. Um, thank you so much to the executive team at Svia Shulik at Western University for helping out behind the scenes. So Young Jin Xion, Eunice Park, Eva Kieran, and Caitlin Sherry, who are gonna be helping out. Um, and just a few reminders before we get started. So um, we ask that the audience, please keep your mics off while the panel uh, can keep their mics on when they want to answer questions. Um, as I mentioned, we will be holding a draw tonight for Amazon gift cards. Um, so the link will be posted in the chat. And we would also like to encourage the audience to please submit their questions um, in the chat publicly or privately to uh, one of the members who have identified themselves in the chat. So Young, Young Jin, Eunice, or Eva uh, will be collecting our questions for us. All right. Um, so thank you again for everyone for joining us um, and we'll get started. So um, how it'll work today is that each of our panel, five panelists will say a bit about themselves. We'll have uh, one of the students introduce them and then they will add on to uh, what they would like to talk about in terms of their expertise and their experiences. And then once all the panelists have introduced themselves, we will go on to have a panel discussion. Um, so to get us started, I would like to invite Amy Kim from UBC to introduce Mario, Dr. Mario Bendani. Hi everyone, my name is Amy. I'm a student here at UBC um, University of British Columbia and I'll be introducing our Dr. Mario Brandani. So Dr. Brandani holds a DDS, an MSc, an MPH and a PhD and he's an Associate Professor, Director of Diversity, Equ Equity and Inclusion and Chair of Division of Dental Public Health at the University of British Columbia. While working as a general dentist in his private practice in Brazil, he volunteered in a long-term care facility, prompting him to concentrate efforts towards gerontology or geriatrics, dental public health, and volunteerism within organizations such as AIDS Vancouver and HIM in BC, Canada. Dr. Brandani got fully involved in engaging with various communities as a teacher from issues of substance use to gender diversity. He teaches and coordinates the dental geriatric modules and is helping to develop the undergraduate and graduate dental public health modules and programs focused on the barriers to oral health care experienced by underserved communities in Vancouver. His private practice in Vancouver has been at a not-for-profit not community clinic also focused on the underserved. As the past president of the CAPHD, he has been involved in position statements on access to care and dental therapy. His research is on similar areas of this teaching with close to 100 peer reviewed publications and book chapters. Please welcome Dr. Mario Brandani. Hello everybody. Uh, after we write those things, we just realized we talked too much. So thank you, Amy, for that introduction there. Uh, I, I joined today from the ancestral and seated and uh, traditional territory of the Scout Salish folks. More specifically, Squamish, Shailor Tooth, and uh, Musqueam. And I am an invited guest in this land, so I do acknowledge their openness to having me here today. Uh, so thank you very much. I do appreciate when we have opportunity to, to have a conversation, really, it's more a conversation than anything here. Uh, as was said, I, I have different hats, uh, but I also recognize my privilege as a white male. Uh, even though I might be gay and Latino, I'm still a white male. And I do use my privilege quite a lot. And I recognize that those that do not have that privilege uh, might experience much more uh, uh, problems and barriers than we. And I think that's a great uh, start of a conversation here. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I mean, I do have tons to say, but I'd rather have a conversation rather than just talk about myself. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Randani. And next we will have, let's see, um, is Yang here? Let's see. Right. 
So I don't see Yi Ying on the call. I will introduce um, Dr. Mary Lin Min. So Dr. Min is a professor of pediatric dentistry, associate chair of research and director of dentistry graduate program at the University of Alberta. She received her DMD degree in Iran, followed by an MSc and PhD degree from the University of British Columbia. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in health education and received a certificate in teaching in higher education from UBC, and also completed a one-year program offered by the American Dental Education Association Leadership Institute and received a certificate in leadership in dental education. Her research interests are social and behavioral aspects of oral health, with a focus on understanding the psychosocial, behavioral, community, and societal influences on the oral health of children, particularly from the disadvantages, uh, disadvantaged marginalized populations. She has more than 30 grants resulted in 75 peer-reviewed papers and four book chapters. She has supervised 17 graduate, 35 undergraduate summer research students and five visiting scholars and has had a number of presentations at the local, national and international meetings. Please welcome Dr. Min. Thank you, Caitlin, for your uh, uh, kind introduction. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, so for giving me the opportunity to be part of this such an important uh, discussion. Um, I think the reason I, I am here, so first of all, I'm not a, a white male. I'm actually <laughs> consider myself a brown uh, woman and, uh, and I'm also an immigrant. Uh, I migrated to Canada about 21 years ago. I landed in, in Vancouver, and um, but I had the privilege of reaching to this point, which I am so proud of. It was not uh, without a struggle, without challenges, but um, um, you know. But I, I I managed to be to be here. Uh, the primary line of my research is improving the oral health of children of new immigrants. I have a specific passion uh, for newcomers to Canada, both immigrants and uh, refugees. And uh, I am hoping to use, uh, uh, to have a better understanding of the ways in which social, cultural, environmental, economical, economic factors determine oral health status of the immigrants and mainly, mainly young children. And um, we are using, uh, we are integrating social and behavioral science into our projects. And we try to make, make them um, like a theory driven uh, projects. And um, in addition to marginalized population, I'm also interested in looking at racism and how racism would affect oral health of, uh, of children more specifically. But anyway, thank you so much for having me uh, today. Thank you, Dr. Amin. And uh, now I'd like to invite Serena Liu from University of Saskatchewan to introduce Dr. Lindsay Sher. Go ahead, Serena. Thanks, Caitlin. So Dr. Lindsay Sher is from Saskatoon and studied at the University of Saskatchewan. She received a Bachelor of Science with great distinction in physiology in 2010 and graduated from the College of Dentistry in 2015. Dr. Sher received awards for both academic achievement and student involvement. For five years, Dr. Sher enjoyed a variety of excellent learning experiences working as an associate dentist at a general or at general dental offices throughout Saskatchewan. She likes to have fun at work and that's why she created Greenleaf Dental. She believes that when she and her staff are happy and well cared for, that her patients are happy and well cared for too. Dr. Sher is thrilled to bring her ideas to life and share her unique perspective with the people of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan through Greenleaf Dental. Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much, Serena, for the introduction. Like she said, I'm Dr. Lindsay Sher from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, a little bit more information about me and the general practice I've been doing for six years now. Um, shortly after graduating, I moved to Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, which is a more northern community. Um, I worked there for a few years and had the privilege to treat primarily Indigenous people and newcomers as well. 
Um, in the last one year, I've opened my own clinic in Saskatoon, that's Greenleaf Dental. Um, and here at Greenleaf, I have the privilege of treating primarily newcomers, queer people, and very um, nervous or phobic patients. Um, my passion is truly connecting with my patients and providing a, a welcoming and inviting atmosphere for all people. And I'm so excited and honored to be here today to um, talk more with all of you about these important topics. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Cher. Um, and so now I'd like to invite my colleague from Western University, uh, Eunice Park, to uh, introduce Dr. Abbas Jasani. So Eunice. Dr. Jasani is a tenure track assistant professor in the Department of Restorative Dentistry and the coordinator for community dental outreach at Shulik Dentistry, University of Western Ontario. Dr. Jasani has completed his graduate training with a focus on public health dentistry at the UBC Dentistry. And while finishing his PhD, um, he has headed the Department of Operative Dentistry at the University of Saskatchewan, where his teaching philosophy focused on risk-based patient management, and minimally invasive dentistry. Currently, his work is looking to, into the barriers of accessing healthcare services in marginalized communities, particularly from lower social economic status, HIV, HCV positive, LGBTQ2S, et cetera, and risk-based caries management in Ontario. Thank you very much for such a great introduction. Um, I want to start this talk firstly to express my sincere solidarity um, with my fellow Londoners uh, and the communities beyond. As you might have read in the news, uh, a very sad incident happened in the city of London two days ago where a family was assassinated just because of um, their faith um, and it was a hate crime. And um, me and my partner uh, had decided to go to the vigil tonight, but we couldn't because of this commitment, but here I am sharing my solidarity and my condolences to the fellow Londoners, to the Canadians and um, everyone around. And this also further highlights the importance of the conversation that we are having tonight, that um, we have a lot of uh, work to do, um, starting from our backyard um, and moving forward. And you as a future healthcare providers are the best people to talk to so that we can make a permanent positive change. Um, I'm greatly, greatly humbled and honored to actually share this space with, uh, with, with these wonderful panelists and most of them are actually my mentors. Uh, Dr. Brondani is my former supervisor, um, graduate supervisor. Dr. Uh, Amin was one of the people that I always looked up to because of her great work in the field. Uh, Dr. Lance Rucker, um, whatever I teach, um, a big part of my teaching component at, Sh at Shulik and, uh, and in uh, uh, Saskatchewan came from him. In fact, two days ago, uh, two weeks ago, I referred one of my students to his, uh, to his papers and his videos about dental ergonomics and all the other wonderful panelists. I'm greatly, greatly honored and humbled. And I have, I do not have even like 25 publications here to actually make myself as, uh, as credible as these other wonderful candidates. But I can say that um, for the last uh, seven to 10 years of my graduate experience in Canada, I have learned so much from all these wonderful folks. And it has enabled me to bring some really good change, positive change in the organizations that I have worked with. Uh, I uh, headed the Department of Sask uh, Operative Dentistry in Saskatchewan, where my teaching focus on minimally invasive and risk-based uh, management of the patients, where my philosophy was not only to drill and fill um, at the, the, uh, the teeth of the patient, but look at where they're coming from, what are their individualized risk factors, and tailor the treatment approach according to those factors. Similar approach in Schulich as well, where in restorative dentistry, uh, we look into more uh, risk-based and person-centered care. And, and I'm also having um, the uh, Schulich outreach program where we're actually expanding our dental outreach to, this, to, more, uh, to the vulnerable communities in Southwestern Ontario and internationally, particularly in Uganda um, and Rwanda. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shani. 
And finally, I have, Dr. I have uh, Matt Shea from University of Toronto. Um, can you see on the call here? Yep, I'm here. Yeah. And he will be introducing Dr. Kimberly Craig. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Craig. She is a general dentist who graduated from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia in 2010. Dr. Craig has worked across a range of private practice and public settings, in both Australia and Canada. She has also participated in various dental volunteer programs in countries such as Laos, the Philippines, Guatemala, and Peru. She moved to Canada in early 2019 as Australia was too sunny and warm. And Dr. Craig loves living in downtown Toronto, currently works at Church Wellesley Dental Center, and although she's currently on maternity leave. So the Church Wellesley Dental Center works to provide an open and inclusive care for all patients, particularly the LGBTQI patients. And Dr. Craig loves the variety of being a general dentist and takes pride in working to provide a welcoming and inclusive environment for all of her patients. Please welcome Dr. Craig. Thank you, Max, uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm certainly privileged to be part of this uh, very educated uh, panel. I have far fewer letters after my name. Um, so a little bit more about me. For the past two years, I've been privileged to work uh, in the village in Church Wellesley, you know, which is the centre of uh, Toronto's LGBTQI2A or Pride community. Um, and our practice is dedicated to providing open, inclusive care to everyone, but specifically with focus on the Pride community. Um, you know, for full disclosure, I'm a heterosexual cis woman. So while I'm privileged to serve this community, uh, I'm not a part of it. Uh, and as you've heard, I'm a general dentist. So I don't have specialisation uh, in this area, but uh, I've treated many diverse populations over my career. Uh, and I took a lot of effort to educate myself uh, prior to working with the community church worldly. Um, you know, I found it very valuable to have a good work and clinical knowledge of issues facing the communities I'm working with, um, as well as approaching, you know, every day at work with hyper empathy and understanding uh, that from my privileged position, I can't understand the full weight of microaggressions uh, and discrimination that my patients have faced before seeing me. So really working hard to make them feel as comfortable as possible while they're in our practice. Um, you know, every day I I hear the stories from patients about the past negative experience that they've had accessing medical care, accessing dental care. Um, so we're really working constantly uh, to update uh, our guidelines and our practice to make everyone feel as welcome as possible while providing them with exemplary dental care. Uh, thank you for welcoming me on the panel. I'm uh, very happy to be here. All right, thank you, Dr. Craig. So as you can see, we have a very well-rounded experience-wise panel to draw upon. And so we'll, it'll promise to be a great uh, discussion today. Um, before we get started, uh, on behalf of the dental schools who have joined us today, I would just like to acknowledge that our universities are located on the traditional lands of the indigenous peoples of Canada. We respect the long-standing relationships that indigenous nations have had to the land and they are the, as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that in Indigenous people endure in Canada, and we accept responsibility as public institutions to contribute toward revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. All right, and so without further ado, uh, we'll get started with the discussion. Um, so I've asked the panelists um, if they would like to bring up any topics that they um, would to their fellow panelists or any questions that you would like their, um, to, them to share their thoughts on. But uh, we have prepared a list of questions, um, myself and the rest of the SPIA team um, that we'll draw upon. So to get started, um, our first question is uh, about equity, diversity, and inclusion overall as concepts. So what do those three words mean to you and why are they important? So feel free to chime in any, anytime you have any thoughts you would like to share. Uh, I, Marin, you want to start with that one? <laughs> I can explore it if you <laughs> I, I just thought we, we keep the same order, but that's fine. No, 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 no. Um, so, okay, so ADI, it's very hot words, you know, like with a lot of applications and, um, uh, you know, especially in the past, few years and it's hard to go a week without hearing, you know, like EDI 
at the university level, at the society level, in any uh, kind of news policy or a strategy planning. So th that's, that's really hot topic. Uh, however, when we think about the definition of equity, diversity, inclusion, it is uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to define because they are used interchangeably, right? So it depends on the, 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 the context uh, of we, it is used like, um, it, it is used, it is being used. Uh, but uh, so, so even myself, uh, I found I found it challenging to to separate to have a separate definition for each of uh, each of these terms, uh, but that's that's what came to my mind. So diversity is often about a range of perspectives and presence of differences. So like having representations from from different sectors, like for example in a specific setting. Uh, we talk about race or, or gender or sex or sexual orientation. Or in some cases, we talk about ethnicity, religion, nationality. So this is, if we have a true representation of each of these different identities, then we consider uh, that setting a diverse setting. But that would uh, support inclusion. And by inclusion, we mean uh, creating a safe environment for each identity to feel valued, to feel welcomed, and encouraging um, input and feedback from different identities. So someone may feel like uh, inclusion would be a, a natural consequence of diversity. But not necessarily, you know, like in a group, in a team, we may have representatives from different identities. However, if they are not valued equally and they are not welcome to share their opinion, then we do not, we do not have inclusion. We only have diversity. So inclusion also supports diversity. And then when it comes to equity, it's more like about fairness. Uh, sameness, ensuring that all different people in one group have equal access to the same opportunities. So in a way, equity re recognize diversity and inclusion and also support both diversity and inclusion. So it is hard at first to tell like, what is the definition of each? But if we want to address them, then we have to we have to be able to define them properly and have a deep understanding of each word. So I think this is really this is really a first necessary step to to address EDI in any setting. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Uh... Those that know me, I am a devil's advocate. And uh, so I probably will challenge you here rather than give you answers. Uh, I mean, if you want the definition of those terms, you just go to dictionary and look for them. Whether or not you agree, uh, which was, I think along the lines of what Marian mentioned, it's, it's an open discussion. But uh, as a director of DEI at UBC, I always question myself, what is diversity? We know, I'm just looking at those that have the camera on. This is a quite diverse panel and others that are around here, but is it so? How do we know that we are a diverse group of people? I pose that question all the time to my students. Uh, you know, they, they, we like to think and to the staff as well and to the faculty as well, we like to think that we are diverse, but are we? Uh, who are those people or folks that are missing? I know that there is a question about underrepresentation. I think we are falling, falling behind underrepresenting in our in our profession. Uh, when I graduated, that was like almost 30 years ago. That city was male, uh, very conservative. Uh, 
I think now there is a very nice balance uh, and some uh, groups have been, a, have been a more female representative, which is great. I'm not sure if we are less conservative though. And uh, so I think it's one thing to, to consider is, are we open to this discussion? Because for me, one thing that comes to mind when we have discussions like this is, we always preach to the choir. Those folks that have to know they are not here. Those they already know, they join us in this conversation. So that's another thing that I always keep in the back of my mind is, I don't think is anything new to you here. I would, I, I will not assume anything, but I would doubt that any of us here will be racist or homophobic. Uh, you might have your unconscious biases here and there, but it will be unlikely. Now, there are others that are like that. And Abbas just mentioned the horrific incident in London, Ontario there. Um, it's Canada, so you don't need to go to a third world country. That happens here in this wealthy nation. And the symbol behind me, as you know, the uh, residential school legacy, which is just the tip of the iceberg, as you all know, much more will come. I was born and raised Catholic. I'm ashamed of being a Catholic because of what the Catholicists did with uh, not only indigenous uh, folks in Canada, but in Brazil too. Uh, and we treat, I think, indigenous folks that are much worse than Canadians, just to give an idea. But going back to this idea of diverse act of inclusion, I think for me, it boils down to what Marion said about feeling safe to be who you are. I always, I'm an openly gay man, as I, as I told you, if you go to my uh, office door, there are 500 do uh, gay flags there. I am a rainbow, according to my husband, I'm a, my own pride parade. I'm quite happy to be like that, but I, because I feel safe here. I feel sa I, I never experienced anything in Canada. When I'm with my husband on the streets, we are always holding hands. Uh, I might not be do that in Brazil, in certain areas of Brazil, and perhaps not in certain areas in Canada either. Uh, but in Vancouver, I feel very safe to do that. And I think we all have to, to be very proud of who you are, whether, whatever you decide to be, you have to be proud of that. But for me, though, boils down to a representation at the universal level. I always think that a student that doesn't see him or herself or themselves as represented the faculty, meaning, oh, that person looks like me, they might not come to us. Uh, either is race, is skin color, whatever. Uh, if we don't have the, that representation within the faculty, how can we have a representation of the students? All right, I will stop there. I will just expand on to what Dr. Brandani mentioned about being safe. And I can totally relate to that because I was born and raised in a very uh, conservative uh, religious country. And until like a couple of years ago, I would not have ever come out as well as a proud gay man. Um, I never, the idea of just being called gay would be, would be considered so derogatory to me, would be considered so self-ashaming to me. And this proves a point that how an environment or a country or law or policy can actually change who you are as a person and can help you evolve and grow as a person as well. And that's exactly the philosophy which I want to which I want to uh, move on or carry on in my teaching and in everything that I do. Um, Dr. Amin laid out all these definitions very eloquently. Um, but when I talk about my philosophy of it, it is to create that safe nurturing environment for our students and for our patients. So they are not afraid of being themselves. Um, that's the first thing that I say in my sessions, um, let it be in Saskatchewan here, that this is a safe learning environment. You can express your thoughts, your views um, openly, and then we will have a discussion according to that. So the safety element <clears throat> is extremely important now in everything that we do. That's my two cents on this. Thank you. I um I don't have too much to add to what's um already been so eloquently spoken. Um, but Dr. Merriam's um definition for inclusion of the safe environment 
for each identity to feel welcome. That really stands out to me um, as my mission in private practice and hopefully the mission for any general dentist or practicing dentist, student dentists who want to um, give their patients the best experience possible. Thank you. And again, yes, I don't have too much to add. Everyone's addressed it quite eloquently, but I would say, you know, talking about EDI, I think is wonderful because I'm really only just starting to scratch the surface how much patients can avoid care and healthcare if they don't feel included, if they don't feel safe. So I think it's wonderful that we're talking about it. Perfect. Thank you all for contributing your thoughts on that. Um, so within EDI, and you guys kind of touched this on this already, uh, we want to talk about access to care. And that was a, one of the issues that our team highlighted a lot. So uh, first off, we want to ask about uh, barriers to care. So what are some of the most common uh, barriers to access to care that you've encountered? And are there any barriers that have surprised you? I can jump in to um, begin. Um, I'm sure some of the other panelists will have some other information to add as well. Um, but the biggest access to care barrier um, that I see in private practice has to do with finances, SES, insurance. Um, yeah, everybody's nodding their head because we, we can agree about that. Um, and as I was thinking about this question, um, I realized that even, even though I noticed that or I acknowledge that, I actually don't even know how great that barrier is because most patients who don't have insurance I'm not seeing them or, or they're not seeing maybe anyone. Um, so I think that's a really, really important one to point out that not everyone has private insurance and not everyone is even making it to the dentist for us to see um, what barriers there are to giving them the best care possible. Uh, well, I can follow um, on what uh, was said. Uh, access to care and barriers to access to care is actually um, one of the areas of my research interest. And um, um, despite like talking about financial barrier as the primary barrier uh, to access to care, uh, in the projects that I have done, especially with the immigrant population, I also work with low income families in Alberta, not necessarily um, coming from immigration background, but even being low income. Uh, it's not as simple as what we think. And uh, oh, even though like the, the first barrier that would be highlighted is um, uh, not having financial, in, uh, financial uh, not having dental insurance or financial security, uh, but um, it, it is a complex um, situation and it would have a lot of uh, uh, behavioral and social aspects into it. Uh, for example, I have worked with uh, uh, like immigrants and with the refugees. And for the refugees, many of them, they said that they felt, you know, like first, uh, being discriminated by the dentist because uh, they didn't want to see their refugees for different reasons, just didn't want to see them. Like, for example, in the past few years, uh, uh, since the Syrian refugees kind of were accepted in, in, in Canada and uh, we interviewed them, we, 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 we talked to them and it was a challenge for them to be accepted by the, by, by the dentist. And that created mistrust. You know, like many of them, they, they, um, they didn't trust what the healthcare provider, more specifically dentists, uh, recommend them. And especially dentistry, because um, it, it is mainly offered through private sector, right? So the, the, the cultural differences, between the immigrant population and the, uh, the, the Canadian population creates some sort of mistrust, that, 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 is, um, that is a very strong barrier to access to care. 
some of them, they didn't have the typical barriers. They didn't mention it, but they did mention this mistrust and uh, um, treated differently uh, as a barrier to access to care, dental care. Uh, so again, my hat as devil's advocate here, uh, I think we are not doing enough as dental providers and, and including hygiene there as well and dental therapists. Uh, reason why we have dental therapists is because that they don't wanna go to areas where they should go. So that aside, uh, one thing that I always tell my students is uh, maybe not emphatically enough is, Yes, we are all dentists. We know that oral health is important, but guess what? Somebody that is homeless, that is experiencing trauma, that is experiencing substance use, the last thing they wanna do is brush their teeth. They have to survive first. So let's talk about minimum wage or survival housing here. Housing in Vancouver is crazy expensive. So is Montreal and Ontario for that matter and Toronto. Without that, Forget about oral care, they will not come to see you or us if they don't have those basic minimal necessities. Uh, there is an, a, a national discussion now on universal access to care, the NDP move forward that idea, whether or not will be will materialize is a different story. Uh, maybe not uh, as, 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 as fast as we want to, but we cannot uh, uh, pretend that that doesn't exist. And I've, I'm very fearful to say this, but uh, I really doubt that profession would embrace universal dental care in this country. Uh, I am a dentist. Uh, yes, there is a big, uh, is, a, is a business at, at the same time. You have a gigantic overhead. You have to pay staff. You have to, to pay yourself. You have to pay your bills. But at the same time, uh, and that's from my, my private practice as in a not-for-profit, all patients that we see are patients that are not seen by a regular dentist, either because the insurance is too low, and I agree, uh, my clinic is not for profit, so we cannot make a profit after paying salaries and, and, and um, equipment. We have to reinvest in the clinic. That's a different model than a, than a provider, so let's keep that in mind. But the patients that we see are those that are not seeing. And, and, and it's not only because they cannot afford, sometimes it's blunt races because they are homeless. And here in BC, we do have insurance if you are in welfare, it's still low, uh, but there is, but dentists are not taking it. Perhaps they could take one or two. I'm not saying that they should all focus only doing that, but if they do a little bit here and there it would help big time. Just to add on to what Dr. Brandani said, uh, I fully agree with but with the point that has been discussed. So a few problems that's going on um, over here in this situation. So it's, whatever things that have been discussed, it tells us A, we need more robust curriculum, curricular changes where our students are made fully aware of their social responsibility um, and their social accountability. So that needs to be there. Then we need changes from the policy level as well. Um, we would spend as a government or as a country millions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, on emergency visits of dental problems, which can be fully prevented if that money is channeled on the preventative services. Okay, uh, caries we know is the highest reported infection worldwide, and yet we do not have anything in our insurance system, in our publicly funded system, that would help to prevent the highly reported um, um, infection. So that, um, as a profession, as going back to the policy point, um, when a medical doctor graduates, the amount of debt that the, the medical doctor has is substantially less than what a dental graduate would have. Um, close to 300 to $500,000 each graduate who, uh, is accumulated with the debt. And then obviously they have this big loan to pay off. So it's not, the excess of care is not just about, I feel it's not just about the one aspect of affordability, but that affordability basically um, 
is shared between the with all these other uh, problems um, that we have to address on both curricular and policy level to make the access to care um, uh, affordable or or um, to reach out to the most vulnerable populations. Um, and just to add to what the other doctors have said, you know, from my personal experience, when I'm looking at barriers to care that patients experience, what's, you know, a few that have surprised me is the patients not accessing care due to a fear of judgment from us. So that goes to what Dr. Bodani said, you know, as dentists, we say you haven't seen the dentist for 30 years. And we immediately say, oh, that's terrible. This person, you know, we've talked about could have been homeless, could have had everything else going on in their lives. And that's why they haven't accessed care. So, you know, keeping in mind from our privileged position as dentists that we don't understand what their patients have been going through beforehand. Um, most of what I've learned in my career, I've learned through making mistakes. So I've had a patient come in who didn't see a patient, who didn't see a dentist for 20 years when I was a new dentist. And she and I joked about it during the appointment. Then she felt that that was negative by the end of the appointment. So now I'm very careful to be very positive whenever anyone comes in. They may feel guilty for not having come in for a year or for 10 years or for 20 years. And I am positive the whole way saying, congratulations for coming in. You've done the right thing here. Let's work together to get you back to dental health and keep it very, very positive. Because, um, you know, teeth are the most important thing to us, but uh, not to everyone else. There's, they've got a whole other life going on. Um, and the other barrier to care that I found uh, surprised, particularly working with LGBTQI patients, is the fear of negative experiences because they have so many negative experiences when accessing healthcare. Um, it is it becomes a major impediment to trying to find that healthcare. Great, all right. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, so going back to uh, the idea that uh, for what you guys mentioned about um, EDI in general and what that means to you, a lot of you echoed um, the idea of having a safe environment for, those, for your patients. Um, and so with that in mind, as dentists, what kinds of things can we do to help make care more accessible and how can we make our practices more welcoming and uh, help everyone feel safe? Um, so, um, one of the things that I do or my main approach in my private practice in um, making sure that I'm doing everything possible to have a welcoming environment and, and providing that safe environment is I try to consider all parts of the patient experience from their own perspective and not just from my perspective as the practice owner, as the dentist or, or whichever staff member the patient might be interacting with. And for me, that starts right from opening the door, or it can even be before they make it to the clinic. It can have to do with, you know, the way you um, promote yourself or advertise yourself. But at my clinic, when you walk in the door, there's a very large sign on the wall that says, all smiles welcome. Um, and I like to add a lot of different kind of personal touches around the office to keep things calm, welcoming. For me, that's a lot of plants. I love to have them around, it makes me feel great. So that's my approach, doesn't have to be everyone's. Um, and then I consider each part of the experience. What is it like for the patient to walk up to the receptionist or the administrative person and speak to him or her and, and have that interaction? What is the next step like? Do they feel comfortable coming back into the operatory? In my clinic, um, there are all closed doors, closed rooms for privacy. Um, and so I, I just like to consider things that way. Um, if I was the patient, would I feel comfortable talking about all the things we've just discussed, like history, um, my finances, my health, et cetera. Um, and so I think for anyone who's in private practice, it's really important that all members of your team are on the same page as you. Um, and so that that welcoming energy can be experienced really from start to finish. Uh, so as you notice, I dropped the doctor. So I'm calling you guys for your first names uh, and I'm not going back on that one. So sorry about that. <laughs> But what Lindsay say is for me is key. So for the students that are here to become, uh, to be dentists, 
have a very excellent staff with good communication skills because the patient sees you after the patient saw the front desk, after the patient interacts with the CDA, then you see the patient if the hygienist haven't seen before you. So you might be the third or fourth person. So make sure that your staff is on board with your philosophy as Lindsay mentioned. Uh, and sometimes they might not be. Right, so be rest assured that your staff is is really the the smile of your clinic, if you want to think like that. Because if they the patients don't feel safe or invited or welcome when they interact, even over the phone, with a front desk staff, chances are they will have a bad experience from that point on. Um, and I'd add to that, yeah, absolutely. Staff training is key, probably the number one. Um, we also work very hard on an inclusive medical history uh, and I constantly update that. That's continually evolving. Um, to, we get feedback from patients about that um, and that provides a lot, of our in, uh, a lot of our information about patients and where they feel comfortable disclosing things to us. Um, so I find that very important, very useful treating patients. Um. I can also emphasize on like training their staff because their staff, they are in the front line. So like technically like they see the front desk and then even the dental assistant or even the dental hygienist and then at the end the dentist. So it would be, but it would be the dentist responsibility to make sure that uh, all their staff are um, um, culturally competent and they are sensitive to, to diversity. And uh, um, it, it, it should be, um, the differences should be recognized and acknowledged, not just ignored. You know, sometimes we think by ignoring it, we are, we are, we are handling, you know, the, 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 the differences while uh, a proper approach is to, to recognize the differences and to, to, to acknowledge and to, to handle it properly. And I think yeah, that's the responsibility of the, of the dentist to make sure that the staff is culturally competent. So in addition to staff being culturally competent, you as a dentist needs to be culturally competent as well. So you can have the most, uh, you know, communicable staff and hygienists. And then if you're arrogant and you are rude, then it's not gonna help the purpose, okay? Um, and also, we spend a significant amount of time with our patients. We, our patients are not in and out like, like medical doctors, right? Um, also, our patients don't really see us when they're sick. They come for prevention. You, as a hygienist, you might be seeing your patients every three, four months. As a dentist, you might be seeing them once in every six months. So we get this great opportunity to develop this connection and this rapport with the patient and direct them to the services that they might not feel comfortable to access. So your communication skills are key. Um, when I'm with my patients and with my students, I like I want to know what they eat, what what they had for lunch, or how they got to the school, or how they find weather, because this is how they open up. This is how both students and patients feel comfortable and safe. And this tells me that where they need support and help, and how can I, um, you know, help them. So communication, absolutely very, very important. Secondly, I feel depending on the demographic of where you're located, you can introduce some small steps or changes in your practice. For example, if you are located, located in predominantly LGBTQ community, then a pride flag on, in your practice can make a big difference. Or if, or if um, in, when you have your holiday calendar on your notice board or something, you have all Christian, Islamic, Judaism, you know, all the holidays on that would welcome people from all the faith. So these little small changes can actually strong, send very strong message and can make a big difference in the way people uh, perceive um, you as a dental care provider. Awesome, you here. Uh, so now that we talked about how to make your uh, clinic or your practice more uh, comfortable and create a safe environment for everyone, uh, I wanted to just go back to the major barrier that you guys first mentioned, uh, which is finances. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, some patients might not, a lot of patients cannot um, 
come to our practices in the first place because they cannot afford it. Um, or if they do come to our practices, um, sometimes patients uh, cannot afford, say, the most ideal treatment options, um, say, from a dental perspective. Um, and so what advice do you have for dental students who might be learning to navigate uh, financial issues with patients as they start seeing patients and for dentists who uh, deal with this issue ongoing, um, on an ongoing basis in practice? Firstly, I want to say um, if they're not, if they're unable to come to you and it may sound cliche and whatnot, you have to go to them. Okay, that's the whole paradigm and idea of outreach. You go to them, make, make it an hour in a week, an hour in a month, a day in a month, and so forth. This is the social responsibility that you have. We cannot leave the population who cannot come to us for whatsoever reasons uh, and let them suffer. You can give it back in so many different capacities. And, and I think that there is a lot of goodwill within our, within our communities and within the dental community. A lot of people do want to come back either in a form of being adjunct in our schools to give it back to the students for the teaching or do some form of pro bono or outreach service. So that's, I think that's, that's something that you, we all must do. Um, Secondly, the different ways we can we can um, help our patients to get access. So pro bono could be one of the ways. Um, typically, in schools, we have a list of public funded clinics that if there's something that we can absolutely not do anything about, then there are a list of uh, publicly funded clinics that we can refer our patients um, um, to to uh, to consider. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel this responsibility comes on you. And if you want to help, then there are ways that you can help your patients and your students. Uh, something I feel very passionately about when you're talking about cost with patients is making sure that you're offering all patients all treatment options. Um, and, you know, this is up and down the socioeconomic spectrum. So this is why, you know, personally, when I'm working, I want access to amalgam and silver diamine fluoride so that I can offer that as a patient, an option for patients. It may not be the prettiest option, but they're good sound evidence-based options that can last a long time. And not having those options to offer to people, I find really uncomfortable. You know, at least you can offer them the cheapest possible option. If they can go up from there, that's wonderful. Um, but I think, you know, as dental students working on those skills and having those skills for how much you might need them, uh, depending on where you're working, is really important. Now, uh, one thing, and, and that might be anecdotal. Uh, uh, so along the lines of what Kimberly mentioned, I, I know that some schools, they, they don't teach amalgam anymore. Uh, so for me, I have amalgams. I, never, I would never change them until they, they are fine, unless they break. Uh, but, uh, so, but it's sad that we are we are talking about access and, and, and treatment planning and options. And yet some students, they might have not been trained putting amalgam or, or, or placing amalgam. Uh, some schools are just composite. So uh, I think we are doing a disservice. Uh, uh, I know that, you know, there is a lot of uh, th talks about mercury and what have you, but no, is I mean, evidence says that it's safe. Uh, 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 so yeah, I would just uh, I would just leave that there. Um, all I can add is um, before being a dentist, we are a healthcare provider. There is no difference between us and uh, medical doctors or nurses. So we have to keep this in mind. Uh, our dentistry is um, kind of a uh, there is a tendency to, to kind of make of ourselves bef different from the other healthcare providers. And mainly because in, in, in Canada, we don't have a universal coverage for, for, for dentistry. But, and that makes us more uh, um, kind of fall into a business model of, uh, uh, of running a practice. Of course, there is no doubt that, you know, being in a private practice, 
you have to be aware of you know all the challenges financial challenges and you have to run the practice but sometimes we forget that we also we are also a healthcare provider so the suggestion is not a, yeah, of course, like if you can do some pro bono, that's, that's absolutely fine. But if you don't, or if you are not able to provide any pro bono in your, in your private practice, at least be open to contribute to some other publicly funded programs. And I'm pretty sure in any, in different cities in Canada, we do have this type of clinics. And it might be only, you know, half a day per month but it makes a difference. So it's all about like how we look at, how we look at our responsibility as a healthcare provider and how accountable we are to the society. If we feel ourselves like accountable, uh, then we will find a way to, to contribute, not necessarily in our own private practice, but in a way that works for each of you. Absolutely. I agree with everything that's been said on this subject. Um, and to bring it back a little bit to the students who are soon going to be navigating these waters themselves um, without the help of their supervisors once they graduate. Um, really, um, I think the most important first step is doing a really good exam and proper diagnosis. And I'm so glad that um, Dr. Dean Colbinson is on the call today because he was an instructor of mine at the U of S and I've thought of his classes pretty much every day since I've graduated. Like, yes, this, is, this was really the most important class. So for the students, get your sound diagnosis for the whole mouth, of course. And then from there, you can make your gold star treatment plan. Of course, we all wanna make our ideal treatment plan. Um, and, and you'll offer that or explain that to every patient that you have. And then you'll also have a conversation with them about what they're able to do, um, what all of their factors are, what's going to work for them. And then you're going to come up with some various treatment options or a different, perhaps different treatment plan with that patient for what's going to work best for them. So it's really important that um, the students work hard to know the different ways that you can treatment plan and, and meet your patients exactly um, where they are. And I also would like to add that it's important to keep the reverse in mind too. Like you may see a patient who has supplementary health um, benefits, which is one thing that we have in Saskatchewan here, which is very minimal coverage, but rather than just go, okay, you're covered for X, Y, Z only, I'm not even going to tell you about these gold standard options is a mistake as well. So it's important to um, explain all options to people, give them options for cost, give them options for insurance. And as a new dentist, um, I think that's one of the most important skills that, that you can develop. Uh so just as a segue, and I, I have to say this. Uh, so chances are that the new students might not be able to open their own practice. So choose wise who you want to associate with because the practice has to reflect your philosophy of care. So don't go just because, you know, is, is in this area or is run by so-and-so that is a famous doctor. Guess what, if, if it doesn't, go along with your philosophy of care, as was just discussed here, might not be a good fit for you. All right. All right, thank you everyone. So it does sound like it's very important that uh, all dentists and dental students do their part to treat these populations. Um, but it can be tricky, as you guys mentioned earlier, um, when you have that mistrust or, you know, patients have had negative experiences either with healthcare or dentists in the past. Um, and so can you please speak about uh, where that mistrust comes from and what we can do to address that? Well, some of the words that I heard from the newcomers, um, <laughs> so it's exactly their words. 
um, dentists, they, they just want to make money. So they put some chemicals on your teeth. So you have to go back again <laughs> every year to have that, that chemical. I understand that that chemical could be fluoride and we have plenty of evidence to, to uh to, to, to support our, our, our treatment plan but sometimes th this is miscommunication that create mistrust so um they have the right to know the patient has the right to know and so uh, like maybe if if there is a better communication with the, between the dentist or dental staff and the uh, the patients some of this misunderstanding and mistrust uh, would be eliminated. I do understand that uh, in some private practices, their model is purely business. So um, I hope none of us would be one of those practices. But in the majority of cases, sometimes it's just miscommunication. So yeah, patient's awareness is really important and education of, parents, of patients. Um, and yes, I'd follow on from Dr. Min's point um, that, you know, in terms of getting, as dental students, in terms of getting the patient's trust to start with, start with the explanations, uh, you know, rather than the treatment, you might be able to complete four fillings an hour and that's wonderful, but the patient doesn't know why you've done them or what they can do to prevent them and then they never go to the dentist again because they feel like they haven't been heard. Um, you know, I think back to an old couple I saw once who previous dentists had scaled off 20 years worth of calculus and these this couple refused to have any more cleans because their teeth were loose and they had holes in their teeth after they went away from the dentist. So if you started with the communication, first of all, about why that calculus needed to be removed, those patients could have been kept with dental health. So I, you know, even at the detriment of your production that day, not looking so good, explain to patients and you'll be paid back in spades uh, as patients will trust what you say further on. Uh, that would be something I'd uh, continue. Absolutely. I totally agree um, with what Dr. Kimberly was just saying about taking the time with your patients in the beginning to build that trust. And then once you have that connection with them, you can continue to always explain what you're doing, but it, it's so much different. It's so much easier. You almost can reach a point where you're explaining things to patients and they're like, yeah, I know, just do it. And like, I trust you. And of course I still explain to them because that's how I like to practice, but it really comes from that beginning where you take the time to connect with them, educate them, um, and to use language that all people can understand. Um, and not just our fancy dental words. Like we might turn and say some technical things to our assistant for note purposes, but then I always say, I'm going to explain this to you in just a minute. Um, and with um, some of the experiences that I had working with people, indigenous people in Northern Saskatchewan, a lot of the mistrust comes from just the experiences that they've had, um, experiences that they've had themselves, maybe from childhood, teenager into adulthood, and also um, the experiences that they've seen their parents have, they've learned through their families, um, something that I almost call like inherited experiences. And um, I think it's very important to sit with people when they're talking to you about these things, listen to them and believe them. And it um, comes back to what I was saying earlier about creating a welcoming environment, thinking about it from thinking about the experience from the patient's perspective. Um, I like to try and get in that mindset and be like, okay, what would it actually be like if this happened to me? If what these people are telling me happened to them, like it could be like sometimes patients would maybe open up to me about their experience in residential schools when they were children. And that came up because they were talking about how it, they don't trust most dentists or they say something like, oh, I feel safe here. I can actually tell you this. And then, you know, away we go on a different conversation. Um, but it's really important to, to provide that space when people feel comfortable, let them talk to you. You don't have to give them advice about anything or, or even tell them that you're so sorry or you feel so bad. It's really about holding the space to listen and empathize and then say, okay, I understand why you feel that way. How, am I, how can I make your treatment comfortable going forward? 
And sometimes that's all it takes to get that trust in the beginning. And then you can build some amazing relationships. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the mistrust is because, of, is because of us. I mean, they saw dentists, right? Whether or not was close to our offices or not, but they saw all the dental providers. So it's us, the mistrust came from us, not us this panel, but probably us elsewhere. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, but the other thing uh, we cannot forget is, uh, uh, the focus has to be on the patient. Uh, I know that we was mentioned initially, you know, you, you see your dentist every six months. Is there evidence for that? No, right? So we know that there is no evidence to say you have to come back every six months. That has been this, that has been the bunk already. Uh, the, but so imagine that and then the, and the patient will come with the Dr. Google. They will use the internet and bring you things that they read that they saw in the news, and then what, right? Uh, uh, and some patients are quite well educated when it comes to things that happen with them because it's their mouths that they, ha they, they, they know what they have sometimes. Uh, so keep very aware of patients' expectations uh, uh, and be careful what you promise. Uh, did all my feelings stay in place? No. Some fail, some I have to redo it, but you have to own it uh, that uh, and be open with the patient. Don't over promise and under deliver, right? Just a quick, quick thought along the lines of what everyone said. The focus is patient, but I would want to go a step forward and say the focus is person. Okay, this is a time when you need to work with them, not for them. Uh, when you create that that hierarchy that I am there to provide you care, you care and you don't know what's happening with you, that's where the first out of mistrust arises. So this is why now there's a shift of paradigm from patient-centered care to person-centered care, right? So you want to understand everyone's uh, individual journey before you actually um, start all those fancy tools in their mouth, right? Also, um, Educate, when you talk about patient education, uh, it's a two-way stream. When you talk about patient education, you also have to educate yourself as well. And if there are issues, if there are things that you do not know about or you don't feel comfortable about, talk to your patient about it. There's no harm saying, I'm sorry, I don't know much about it. Can you tell me more about it? Or can you educate me? That goes for either their culture, their gender, their religion, um, whatever, whatever it is that you do not know anything that you get in their social history and medical history that you are unaware of, there's no shame or harm in saying, please tell me more about it or educate me more, because that actually will uh, help you develop your connections even better and will get your patients to open up to you. So these are my two things. Great. Um, so kind of expanding upon this topic of um, mistrust and negative experiences, um, some of our team members were particularly interested in the LGBTQ plus community as and many of you have worked with those communities. And um, they wanted to ask about the challenges and negative experiences that uh, those individuals have with dentistry and healthcare. Um, so the question is, uh, why do those disparities uh, arise? And uh, what are some challenges that we may be aware of as dental professionals? Um, and how can we address those? And then another thing that uh, goes along with that topic is, um, should we be asking patients to say things about like their uh, preferred pronouns or their sexual orientation? Is that something that we should discuss with the patient? Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Certainly something this is, uh, I would like to have input from the Pride community as well. Um, that's something why we take feedback at our clinic a lot. Um, you know, we do ask about preferred pronouns and preferred names uh, in our medical history um, so that we can note this down and, and use this for patients. We actively use this. We have staff trained in using this as well um, and staff trained in sensitive be asking about potential names from birth because insurance is often under 
um, previous names. Uh, so rather than, you know, really wanting to avoid never, ever asking a patient, what's your real name? You know, their name at the moment is their real name to them. Um, so, you know, it's simple things like that that we have with staff training. Um, and, you know, this is something I'd be really interested to hear from the Pride community, but our medical history includes everything that I need to know for the clinical treatment of that person. Um, I have not found a dental reason that I need to know a person's gender at birth, so we don't ask about that. Um, is it going to change my treatment if I know that? No, so I'm not going to ask about that. Would patients feel better if I did? I don't know. I don't think invasive questioning for no reason is particularly helpful, but I'm always open to feedback on that point as well. Okay, Kimberly hammered that to the head exactly. Kudos to you to involve the community there. And yes, only ask what you need to know. Uh, uh, there is no point. I never ask gender at sign of birth. Are you kidding me? Uh, but at the same time, don't don't assume that a man that is sitting, a man that is sitting on the other chair might not be pregnant or might not be taking hormones that might impact your care, right? Uh, your subconscious bias about assuming gender or sexual identity by the virtue of their physical appearance could be the reason of the mistrust. I remember my first medical experience in Saskatchewan um, and I ventured to the medical doctor. So the first question was, where are you from? Vancouver. Oh, do you have a girlfriend? So it took me back to the whole, you know, it's not easy to come out. It's not say every time it, that, oh, by the way, no, it's not a girlfriend. It's boyfriend or try friend, I don't know, or nobody, right? So just these, uh, this assumption that just a person looks certain way or has certain attributes, a masculine attribute would be dating an opposite gender, okay? So gender neutral pronouns for sure in healthcare could make a big difference, right? Just instead of saying girlfriend or partner and let the person tell you if it's him, he or they, right? or give, the, give you their name or whatever, right? So that kind of, um, uh, the, the bias. One thing that came a lot during one of my studies I did in Saskatchewan, uh, where I wanted to look into the stigma and discrimination experiences, experience, uh, experiences of LGBTQ community, mostly from the trans community, uh, and their mistrust towards, uh, not more towards the dental care providers, but overall healthcare providers, where healthcare providers were not really comfortable on how to address their issues in terms of transitions, hormone replacement, therapies, pronouns, and so forth. So again, going back to my point, if you do not know, ask, you know, there are tons of resources available in whatever area that you need to explore. Then, uh, uh, go on those resources, learn about those topics. Um, because once you take care of that, then business will come. These patients will come. They will bring money to your office where you provide excellent care and, and you will get whatever you want out of that as well. So that's my opinion. I don't really have um, much more to add than what's already been said, um, but thank you everyone for your comments. You're inspiring me for more um, training that I can do and more training that I can do with my staff. So that's amazing. Thanks. Okay, great. And speaking of training, and you guys have, uh, you, you all have brought this up earlier, um, but part of the work starts with dental education in dental schools um, and starting um, getting students to become culturally competent. Um, so your opinion, what can be done in dental schools to help create a more accepting inclusive environment and to teach students these, uh, these skills and impart this knowledge to them. Things like this. Yeah, and, and I think it should be not only for the students, also for the instructors, because, you know, not all the instructors are culturally competent. Uh, so, yeah, definitely the, the topic of cultural competency should be included in different levels of dental curricula. 
And it's not only like the didot, it's also the exposure of the students from early in their program to, to, to the diverse population that we are supposed to serve um, after their graduation. Um, we are kind of moving toward that, but we are far from reaching to the goal. So still a lot of, a lot of work to do, uh, at least in Canada. So, so one thing that we do here at UBC is we bring the community to the classroom. So for example, uh, I'm not a transgender man, so I cannot talk about transgender issues. So I bring a transgender person to share their experience in class. Uh, when I talk about substance use, I, other than caffeine and sugar, I don't have other substance use. Uh, so I bring those that have experience with substance use to share their experiences. Uh, because I think they are the best teachers to the students rather than myself. So I think community involvement is also important. I um, totally agree with what Dr. Brandani is saying. And um, I haven't been back in the university or the academic environment since I graduated just six years ago. So I don't know like what the current pulse is, um, but I agree that I think it really does start with the instructors, with the professors, with the structure at the university. Um, I know in my time as a student, sometimes you would hear a professor say something inappropriate to a class, to a classmate, maybe formally, informally, and it really um, sets quite an uncomfortable standard for all the students because it's like, do I say something? Do I not say something? People are hurting from this comment. I don't want to stand out. All these kinds of things, you know, that, that can go through students' minds. Um, so I think the more that we can affirm from the beginning, like how we be culturally competent dentists, and not that that means that everyone's perfect right from the beginning, but how we can continue to educate ourselves and, and learn, I think would be really um, helpful for the students. One thing I, I... One thing I frequently hear um, or commonly commonly get from instructors is I don't care if the person is black or white or is straight or gay, I will treat everyone equally. But that's not right. If you don't care where they're coming from, then you're basically ignoring their individual individual problems, their individual journey, who they are as a person. So this is a time when we as an instructor and then as a healthcare providers acknowledge that the needs or the perception or the journey of a black individual will be different than a white individual would be different than indigenous individual. So that, that um, idea of individuality must be acknowledged and then we can tailor our services or our treatment plan according to what that patient needs. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, let me see here for a second. Um, so going back to one of the topics that you, got, um, you talked about earlier is representation. Um, so representation in dental schools um, and within our profession. And so um, the question here is uh, particularly about Black and Indigenous Canadians. So uh, what can be done to address this and why is that, why is representation important? Uh, so I might not answer that question directly, but before that, uh, the students that are here, uh, you folks have the responsibility to better tell us what to teach you as well. So it's a two-way street. So be active, ask questions during classroom, ask, send emails and and demand, really demand uh, that we cover areas that we have not been covered because there are issues off with faculty numbers and uh, uh, teaching assignments, that kind of thing. 
but be vocal. Uh, if there is something missing, if there is something that is wrong or something that was said incorrectly, uh, be active and, 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 and you, you, I mean, students compared to my generation 30 years ago, I could not say anything in classroom because I'll be hammered. Now is the opposite. You have the right to, to say things and to, to, to disagree. And of course, in a very respectful manner, but you have the voice. So take that and, and be advocates for, for dental education as well. Now, going back to the question, uh, I can say from BC and sorry, those from British Columbia, we are not doing enough or at all really uh, for uh, especially uh, can African Canadians, so uh, 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 from Africa in particular, we do have a dark skin color representation uh, from other uh, communities. But if you think about black community, I don't think we are doing nearly or anything really in dentistry. Other, other uh, faculties might be or are much ahead of us. Indigenous, we now uh, start developing a, a a more focused uh, recruitment for students, uh, particularly in the hygiene has been very successful over the years. Dentistry is, is getting there, but it's far from it. But at the same time, again, when I mentioned initially is, if I am indigenous and I go to a website and I see nobody like me, I might be thinking about, you know what, I might be go somewhere else than here because I don't see myself representing this faculty. So that's the other thing. Of course, it becomes the kitchen, the chicken and the egg thing, who comes first, but, uh, but we have to be mindful of that. But from BC, I think we are, we have to do more uh, uh, and I don't think we are doing enough. Yeah, I think the same for Alberta. We are trying to, to be more focused in our recruitment but uh, we are not doing enough either. So <laughs> far from reaching the goals. Uh, how to do it, I'm not quite sure. I think in terms of representation, we have some form of representation and I include myself uh, in that representation as well. So if I include myself, then we have some representation, but we have to do more and specifically reaching out to the vulnerable populations uh, and provide a more inclusive um, care environment for those populations. So in that, in from, particularly from that standpoint, I feel in Ontario, especially Southwest Ontario and Shulik and as a profession, we have to and we must do more. Uh, I, I would like to address the elephant in the room here, which is admissions. Uh, it's highly based on GPR, on your grades. And guess what? Those that don't have enough time or opportunities in life to get good grades to start with, we are excluding them not because they are not capable, it's because we base solely on GPR or GPA, sorry, or uh, other forms of uh, 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 numerical grades. Yes, it is tough to get in dentistry, yes, uh, but I think we should change or, or consider other forms of admitting students, not solely based on, you know, interviews or, or, or grades, uh, I think we, we, we have to come around and I know that some universities are doing that already, uh, but I think that that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, further to what Dr. Amin said um, very early in the conversation, like if we're talking about um, diversity or representation in our um, Dental, amongst dental students, of course, that's very, very important. Um, but then I think the next question is, does that diversity or representation mean inclusion? Like she had said in the beginning, um, 
Uh, so I think that is, you know, the first place to look. And I think it's, it's a really large question and I absolutely don't have the answers, but I think it's very important um, that we continue to, to pay attention. All right, so we have reached the end of our time. So I have one question from the, um, with those submitted from the audience um, that we can address before we uh, move on to final thoughts. Um, and if one or two of you could just answer, um, maybe. Um, is there a limit on the pronouns and assumptions? So for example, don't assume a man isn't pregnant, but does that imply we must now start asking everyone if they are pregnant? Um, is it not that individual's duty to tell the provider that given it's a relatively binary environment? Uh, very good question. Uh, I did not imply that, but you'll be you'll be surprised how many folks you what you saw that they are not necessarily what how they 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 dress up or they express themselves, and that's just fine. But the concern here is uh, uh, if somebody again the example. It might be very rare, but it is, and, and there are there are, there are uh, uh, patients that that are the the gender assigned at birth is not the same that they uh, uh, relate to that. They didn't go to a transition; they kept their reproductive organs, and they might as well be pregnant, being a man. Uh, I'm not saying you have to ask every man. Uh, uh, but that's what I think uh, the folks are mentioned here at the panel is trust. If, if the patient is with you uh, enough and very rare, unless if we screw if you screw up you screw up the appointment, very rarely the patient will leave you if you do a good job. So if the patient stays, maybe that question might not come up at the first appointment, but might come up later, and you become the patient becomes more comfortable with you, and they might tell you more things. Uh, that they they couldn't feel safe enough or welcome or whatever at the beginning, but if you do a good job, the, you give the patient that opportunity to then uh, uh, express whatever they are feeling. But I, I agree with what was mentioned before: the intake uh, instead of you know the the regular boxes, male or female, just leave it open and let them tell you what they are, and it, and, and that's it. And also just to add on to what Maria said, um, by asking pronouns or just asking or using um, gender neutral pronouns or asking their pronouns, you're also sending a message that, okay, so that idea might not be applicable, let's say to a cis heterosexual person, but it does send a message that you are aware and you're open and you know how to respect one's individuality. So it's not, so when I was asked by a medical doctor if I have a girlfriend, I shut down. I was like, whatever thing I'm going to say now, I'll have to educate this doctor because if he doesn't know to start with the gender neutral pronoun, then I just want a paracetamol and get me out of here, right? So these small measures also send a message that you're open, you're aware, and you're well informed. Now, if that particular premise is applicable to every patient or not, that's a different story. But it does send a message about your awareness for sure. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for addressing uh, the question and thank you for submitting that question from the audience. Um, and so to wrap up, I just want to ask uh, the speakers, uh, what final words uh, do you have for dental students and dentists and what advice do you have for them in terms of what we can do to learn more and do better? Well, um, I think Great advice for the students um, is to like go slowly and take your time. And I mean that when you're doing your dentistry and also just everything to do with your patients. Um, be present, be mindful when you're communicating with them. Some of the things I mentioned already is, you know, really, really listening, putting yourself in their shoes. So even if you don't understand why someone might think that we put chemicals on your teeth and then you have to come back every six months so that we make money, even if that doesn't make sense to you, understand 
why someone might think that. Um, and then you can communicate um, much more easily and effectively. Um, and then you also have the opportunity to be learning as much from your patients as you are educating them. And um, like Dr. Josani said, it's, it's not even patients, it's people. So just be present when you're interacting with the people that you get to care for. Um, I also would like to add that be responsible for your education, you know, like you are going to deal with a diverse population, whether you like it or not. So as you are learning different methods of feeling and, you know, like doing prosto and doing, so dealing with the patients and caring for them, it's part, part of your responsibility later on as a healthcare provider. And so you feel, you should feel responsible for uh, having a good training. You should demand actually the, 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 the dental education to make you prepared to deal with diverse population. And as Mario said earlier, that's your job to, to ask us to, to, to train you, <laughs> not wait for the, the educators to offer you this training. So be proactive because this is real and uh, more and more we have uh, you know, like the, 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 this diversity is not going away. It's actually getting bigger. And if you are not prepared, then um, you will not be successful in your future, you know, career. And here I must acknowledge and say that 99% of you do of you do a great job with your patients, with the people you interact. Um, I still have to like think really hard. Last when was the last time I saw a dental student who was not kind and polite and sweet to their patients. So I would also want to tap your back right now and say you are doing a good job and you by the virtue of being here sends a strong message of your proactiveness of your dedication. So I applaud that and I appreciate that. And next time the people who are not here, you should drag them to these conversations as well. So that's one thing that you can do for the next time because we need more of them as well uh, who are not here. Um, exactly as Dr. Jasani said, by virtue of being here, I'd say uh, you've got one of my big main points when you're graduating, which is having an open mind. And the other big main point I'd take away is extreme patience with patients because uh, you know you will get it you probably had it already people coming in saying I hate the dentist from any background we're a really scary bunch to come and see there's a lot going on patients are awake they can't see what's going on they don't understand so I approach all of my patients no matter their background uh, with the fact that they're probably scared on some level and so I really step it back if a patient's rude I'm incredibly polite back to them explain everything I can and go slow uh, because we're not much fun to see. We take that approach, we start from that approach, then we can make our patients as comfortable as possible. Um, and well done for attending these sorts of things because part of making patients as comfortable as possible is understanding patients' background and doing our best to address that. Well, if I may, kudos to Kathleen and all the group for, for organizing this. Uh, uh, it is, I think it is about time and much more, as Marion said, will be discussed. If, uh, if, I, have, if I have any wisdom, uh, uh, I have my four wisdom, so I probably have a little bit more, but uh, uh, don't be afraid of making a mistake. I mean, I misgender my patients sometimes and I try hard to not, but, but guess what? You have to own the mistake and, and excuse and, you know, say, I'm sorry. Uh, because we are humans, humans, we are, we make mistakes. I'm not saying that if you are to extract a 23 and we extract a 24, that's uh, acceptable, but uh, you might misgender a patient here and there. And, and but so acknowledge the, the mistake and, and, and correct yourself and that's fine. Perfect, all right. 
So thank you so much to all of you for joining us tonight. You know, um, we're just scratching the surface on this topic. It's very broad and so many issues within it. Um, but it was wonderful to hear all of your insights and everything that you had to say. I'm sure everyone learned a lot. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists, Dr. Mario Brandani, Dr. Mary Min, Dr. Lindsay um, Sher, Dr. Abbas Jasani, and Dr. Kimberly Craig for joining us for this insightful discussion participating. Um, you know, you all brought a wealth of experience and knowledge and your unique perspectives and it, it wouldn't have been the same without you. So thank you so much um, for your contributions tonight. I would also like to thank uh, the American College of Dentists for their support and for joining us. Um, thank you to the SPIA team at Western University um, for their work behind the scenes tonight, as well as the other executive leaders and presidents of uh, SPIA chapters across Canada for uh, helping to invite you all and uh, put this event together today. And then finally, thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Um, like, like the uh, panel said, you know, you're doing your part by being here and learning more. Um, so that's great. And thank you, everybody.